Хаким по мотивам одноименной повести Николая Гоголя. Фильм. Сценарий и постановка под руководством известного режиссера Александра Птушко. В фильме Ви Наталья Варлей и Леонид Куравлев. Ведьма! Дей Богу, ведьма! Hello everyone and welcome back to Pleasant Evenings Book Club. This is Hannah as always, and as always with me are Roberto and Corbin. You want to say hi guys? Hello, this is Roberto. Hi, this is Corbin. Thanks for joining us again. Or awesome for the first and time. To... If you're a new viewer. That covers everyone. Yeah, it does cover every <laughs> it does cover everyone. It's like that thing that's like um that 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 thing that's like these two books contain the sum total of all human knowledge, and it's like what they teach you at Harvard Business School and what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All people are included therein. <laughs> um, but today we are discussing two movies in a change up from previous episodes. We will be discussing, um, firstly, the Soviet era Russian film V. Uh, as well as uh, Mad God. It's a claymation, uh, or rather stop motion. What's the line on that? I'm not really sure the difference in terms of definition, actually. But um, uh, a stop motion film uh, produced over the course of, I believe, 30 years. Yeah, I, I like these two movies together. It's like different visions of, of Damnation. Yeah, yeah. Really um, just incredibly opposite approaches to making a horror film i think but definitely like uh yeah definitely damnation i think the end of it was pretty grotesque and monstrous though yeah um i have some issues with the end of v in general i think i almost had no issues with it but then i had one really big issue i'm curious uh, yeah i well i don't know should we should we summarize it first and then and then get into it or uh, should i just like lead in with my uh with my complaint if it if it's if it's one that hits at the end, we'll leave it as a you know as a little a little tease for the audience. They'll be like, "What could it be?" Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think when it comes up naturally, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll vocalize it. But um, so uh, in terms of uh, summarizing, uh, I guess V will will do first. Uh, yeah, I think V is like more straightforward. So yeah, yeah. I, I or Corbin can take that one. Uh, I I certainly don't mind if. Sort of, I've sort of seen that story a couple times now in different mediums, so I feel like it'll come back. Um, yeah, yeah. So V is, uh, it's like set in Ukraine, uh, but uh, you know, Russian Ukraine, the uh, age of the the Cossacks, as is said frequently. <laughs> frequently. Um, yeah, frequently, very frequently. Um, but um, yeah, so it's set in the age of the Cossacks, and what what you have is, uh, I believe, a, a a monastery of sorts in Kiev. Uh, this this film opens with, and uh, we see these sort of like um, these seminarians, I guess. Uh, you know, you, you know, sort of uh, doing what uh, boys will do, uh, <laughs> and they're sort of uh, you know just having a time in the courtyard there, and and they're sort of dismissed, I, I, I think, for sort of like a break, you know. Yeah, it really feels like school's out, like. <laughs> Right, 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 and um, so th this comes up like more in the book than in the in in the film, I guess, or the story rather, um, the short story. Uh, but they're they're sort of divided into classes based on seniority. Like I guess I think there's like students, philosophers, and um, like theologians. I'm not I'm not exactly sure how they break it up. There's grammaticians, rhetoricians, philosophers, and theologians. So our story uh, follows um, three of them. Uh, you know, uh, a, a younger one, I believe he was a, uh, a rhetorician. Was that it? And then yes. uh, um, a middle one, a, um, a philosopher. He's sort of our main character. And then an older theologian as they sort of uh, run off into the um, countryside to, you know, I guess do what, what students on break do. I, I think it's implied that they're like going home, you know, wherever that may be. Um, yeah. but, uh, so, you know, the other thing that's like immediately portrayed is the way these, 
these guys like run across the you know the the countryside just stealing everything <laughs> in their path which is interesting but i think i think we'll cover that more in like 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 the analysis than the summary uh, they're rowdy, anyway, rowdy boys right yeah rowdy boys um so uh as, as they're uh, traversing the countryside on their way home they, they they sort of feel a need to stop for the night and and they come upon a you know a, a shack with an old woman in it who uh, insists that they all s- that they can stay there, you know, essentially, but they all must sleep in separate areas. Now, the philosopher, I think, at one point steals a fish, something that was more significant in the uh, in the story than in the movie, I think. But it did it did occur in the movie, and um, goes off to like the barn or something to sleep. He's then uh, sort of like approached by the old lady who seems to be coming on to him, but isn't actually. She like just puts him under a spell. And rides him around the countryside uh, like he's a horse, which, you know, typical shit. <laughs> uh, he at one point sort of uh, like snaps out of the spell enough to get the better of her and essentially beats the fuck out of her, right? Just kills her and shit, you know? Like, uh, she's an old lady, so you, you, I guess you would figure it would be that hard. But, um, uh, but maybe she's not an old lady because she promptly transforms into a beautiful woman. So I, I think we jump ahead at this point. Um, and like the dude, he's like, he receives word at his seminary. It's the same philosopher guy, you know, he receives word that he's being summoned, uh, you know, out to the country or whatever to, uh, read prayers, uh, over a sick, uh, princess. I, I think they describe her as a, like a, like a chieftain's daughter, essentially. Right. Yeah. I'm not really sure how like the Russian, uh, you know, cultural hierarchies would have worked back then. The guy was a judge and it was like his daughter to I don't know if nobility applies, but, you know, a big yeah, shot's yeah. daughter. Right, right. But, you know, so he goes out there and this guy has like sort of a, a, a grange, I guess, you know. Um, well, it should be noted first on the way there, you know, he's taken out there against his will, you know. Um, he tries to escape several times. He even gets everybody drunk and tries to escape at this tavern they have to stop at. Um but uh, the witch seems to have cast a spell on him where he can't quite get away, you know. So that's our first, like, I guess, indication that something is funky, you know. Um, so he gets there and they find out that this girl is dead, you know. And the father is like, hey, uh, do you have any fucking idea why my daughter would have called you here? And he's like, hey, I- I've never met this girl. But of course, <laughs> you know, this is the woman he's killed. You know, this is the beautiful girl she's trans- transformed into, you know, on, on the on the deathbed here. But he's lying. He's saying, you know, I've never, I've never met this girl. Um, he says, uh, you know, I'll pray over her if you want. But, I, I, you know, I'd really rather not. You know, you should get somebody more qualified. Um but, you know, the, the father's pretty insistent, and he ends up praying over her for three nights there, which are just uh, full of, like, unholy terror, you know, essentially. <laughs> you know, every night she rises from the grave and torments him. Uh, he's protected only by his uh, salt circle or what have you, um, which is very interesting, uh, you know, in, in terms of the dynamic that creates. The most interesting thing for me there is that he already had chalk in his pocket. Right. I- <laughs> right yeah i guess summoning circles were just like a thing but like pretty frequently it's like oh you, you better have this in case there's spirits yeah i mean it was like concealed carry some chalk you, just, you never know <laughs> it must have been the science back then probably was but um so you know after after three days of torment at the hands of this thing uh you know he dies uh too um, but the way that this goes down is that, uh, at the last moment, you know, this witch who's been re- re- reviving from the grave every night just to torture him until sunrise when she passes out again, um, is, uh, y- you know, um, <laughs> she summons all these demons from hell, like categorically, like list you know, like name by name, you know, and finally, you know, because she can't find him because of the salt circle, she gets to this one who she is so sure will be able to locate him in this church and, you know, finally do him in, you know. And this one uh, demon happens to be V, uh, this, 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 this big motherfucker with heavy ass <laughs> eyelids, right? So he shows up on the scene and he asks everybody there, he's like, hey, could you please lift up my eyelids, right? <laughs> At which point his eyelids are lifted and he can see where the guy is, you know? 
And that is what breaks, I guess, the integrity of the salt circle, um, you know, and brings a, a, you know, a brave Cossack to his knees. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, think, wasn't it that, um, wasn't it that it was like, he couldn't look at V like he would look away. He's like, I mustn't look. And then he hears the cock crow and he thinks it's daylight. And then when he looks, then V points and goes, there he is. I think that's what happened in the story, but like it, the um, the the movie just simplified it. Like the second V's eyes were open, I thought he just kind of like he was just upon him, and then shortly thereafter, the cock is seen crowing. Right? Am I am I wrong about that? I, he definitely he definitely like is looking down at the book, and he says like I mustn't look. Oh really? Yeah. It's been a minute since I've read the story, but um, the movie I saw obviously more recently. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, regardless, I, th- there's a little scene at the end, and I think this would like lend to your point there, um, where uh, um, like his two friends, the the other two, you know, the ones who became pretty quickly irrelevant to the story, <laughs> uh, they sort of uh, are reflecting on his death and they say, uh, you know, his death was because he had fear, you know, and I think there's this re- repeating motif that like no true Cossack has fear or something like that. You know what I mean? Which is like, I don't know. I mean, like Jesus Christ, like everybody has fear. So, you know, <laughs> eh. but, um, you know, I-, I guess that would lend to your point though, where it's like, they don't want to, you know, don't want to look at him. But yeah, I, I guess now that we're here, I- you know, I'll-, I'll bring up my criticism of it, of the movie. And it's that I like for all of the wonderful special effects they did in it. When they get to the big reveal of the <laughs> the big man himself, like V, I was just like, "What the fuck?" Like that's not what he. That's not what he. He had like the a little finger v. arms. Yeah, it's just like I, all the wonderful demons they made in that. Like, like I, I, you know, the the picture that Corbin sent the group chat earlier would have been a way better interpretation than whatever little stubby arm thing that that was supposed to be. Um, I don't know. I, I was, I was, I, like, the tension for me broke the second that that thing stepped on the scene. It was like if, um, it was like if, like, like a, like a, like a chicken from the grocery store, you know, like a full chicken or like a turkey perhaps were put into a p- pair of blue jeans and walk towards you threatening. <laughs> he looks like, uh, he kind of looks like the... In shape, like the guy from A Real Monsters who holds his own eyeballs. <laughs> Except... Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, it definitely looks a little bit lame. But I don't know. I was I was so on board with just seeing the different guys that like I just kind of appreciated it. I was I was grinning ear to like for the whole end sequence. Well, yeah, and I think I was too, and I, I think that's why it was such a because there were some really <laughs> intense uh, depictions of of creepy and, and grotesque things there, but I, I I think the the actual V that they did like the 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 the, the, the titular <laughs> V, you know what I mean? Like I I just I expected more. I was like, oh, I. I kind of thought the eyelids would go all the way to the floor or something, and that he'd have like a big, long, threatening arms, and not be like a, um, you know, I, I didn't think he'd look like Gordon Ramsay without a shirt. <laughs> he really could not do anything to you. <laughs> yeah, like what would the threat be other than him looking at you? You know, I, kind of, I, I kind of liked it for a nineteen what sixty seven film. Like, there's probably some logistical challenges in creating the... Well, and I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that for sure, but if you look at everything else they achieved in that same film, I don't know. That's fair. The wish was impressive. Yeah, I think there was something about how the the budget had fallen through near the end of production or something. Like, it was, uh... They had more complicated plans... I guess for a movie with like a big reveal like that, it just <laughs> seems like you'd want to save some, uh, <laughs> yeah, save some for the actual reveal. I guess. Yeah, it's like it. It is a shame that the titular V. Like, I think the only reason why, like, I'm disappointed but not mad with it because, I think the general tone of the, of the movies just like wacky enough that it's like horror themes. 
but only lightly horrific. It's like it's a little bit more like a like a little carnival thing. Yeah, yeah. There's some laugh out loud moments, like 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 when when the witch first started riding the uh, the main character. There was like horse sound effects with it. It was I don't know. It was it was funny. <laughs> I, I noticed that when she sits. She sits upright in her coffin. There's a certain uh, yeah. airplane vibe. Like, you know what I mean? Like uh, It looks like a 1960s surf movie or something. <laughs> right, that's you. Yeah, the wackiness maybe shows a sense of self-awareness as to what they were doing. Right. I just think that with, like, the, the, the diversity and, in, of like, wide availability of special effects they clearly had at the, their disposal for those end scenes it's wild that they ran out just for the guy himself i is i guess my my thoughts on it but well then going back to that horse scene like it's clearly like a rear projection or a revolving set or something they show it like you know show close up of the feet lifting up you see like how like slowly it becomes more weightless and you get you know the classic kind of um um, like profile shot of you know sort of someone flying and then you get this one from above and you can see the landscape below them it looks like that's such it looks really beautiful like obviously fake but but very beautiful like there's a sense of like what are the images that we want to evoke here yeah right i guess yeah i i guess i would use that as a good as a good contrast like yeah i think that was stuff like that was like really well put together in the music too Like, that's when the movie really, like, first turned on. Like, I guess, like, they did do a good job of creating the environment for this, like, these rowdy seminarians. Yeah, I love them just (laughs) plundering the countryside of all available (laughs) vegetables. Like, (laughs) not to, like, hijack it, but, like, first of all, it's right outside of the the gates of the seminary, evidently. It's just a a bunch of tables where women set things and talk about them. (laughs) Um... Uh, because evidently because the first thing they do when they get out of the seminary gates is rob all of those tables of everything on them at the at the frustration of the woman who set the things there i guess i i I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be a market but it didn't look like a market regardless (laughs) they just storm it but anyway yeah it was that, that that i wonder if that's kind of how they were able to get away with that. I was wondering, like, why would this be the first... That's what, that's what anything you see about it, about the movie, they always say it's the first horror movie done in the Soviet Union. I think part of how they were able to um, get it approved, besides uh, making it an appeal to to saying, no, this is by this is from a story by Nikolai Gogol. It says, like, one of the, one of the preeminent, like, r- Russian voices you know taking you know take looking at a a folkloric past but it also gets to kind of make fun of the clergy what are the eastern the eastern orthodox like systems like painting them as these kinds of um like greedy parasites their attitude is is i think what ultimately even gets um I, i i think this is more the case in the uh in the in the story than the movie but like it seems a lot in the story like that their attitude towards this woman is like what lands uh the guy in trouble in the first place as opposed to like maybe him rejecting her sexual advances is how more it's more presented in the movie like they kind of like pressure the old woman into letting them stay they like they like use their status as people from the church well, regardless, like, they're essentially just there to take advantage of her and leave. You know what I mean? But um, there's this weird thing in the movie, though, I guess, that occurs where she sort of tries to come on to uh, mm-hmm. the philosopher sexually, which I, I was kind of like, huh, did that happen in the book and I just skipped over it? Or because gross? Or, or... <laughs> did, did she or was that the way he... Did you, or was that the way he took it? Uh, she, like, lies down next to him and looks in his eyes, which, I I mean, maybe she was just trying to get close enough to cast her, you know, her witchery or what have you, but, uh... Like, that feels like a, like a screwy, like, um, like a sex farce, like, like, sec- like comedy setup. Like, he's, resp- like, he's responding how, you know, like a Jim Carrey or something might, like, oh, I don't know about that, and then starts, like, leaping around. 
but they switch the switch <laughs> right. to the um, supernatural. I guess just like they just like do a little, uh, really simple kind of trick where he like jumps away from her, and then they cut to him running to the other side of the room, and she's there. Just the two shots, and then you know, okay, so this this witch is this is a witch old lady, not just an old lady old lady. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess going back to like I could just like describe just aspects of the of the movie. I love when she's like backing up against him and he hits that bell and just like rings out. Yeah. Like really neat ways of like um no pun intended, like putting you into a spell. Well the the witch was very pretty too. Not the old lady of course, but the like the Oh yeah, great I casting. I, I was I was like, wow, yeah, she's very uh she's bewitching, <laughs> like you know what I mean? She could be a witch <laughs> or a princess, depending on your <laughs> like she she could fill both roles. Uh, yeah. But. So that confused me. Like, is is was the young lady like another victim of the witch, or was she truly? Yeah. So the witch? Um, I think you see this kind of thing like roughly a lot in like a lot of like witch movies where like the age thing comes into play, like um. Like, you know, who was the witch and, like, the witch, you know what I mean? Um, I think that she was the witch, you know what I mean? But I think that, I mean, it sounds a little weird to, like, imply that, like, what she chooses to do in her free time is, like, be an old woman on a farm somewhere. (laughs) I, I, I think that, like, the idea is more that, like, um... You know, and having signed Satan's book, you are, like, a bit in his, uh... You know, like you do his uh, his his work, you know, and and to a degree, like some element of that might have been his work, you know, to lead uh, you know, church boys astray, you know. Mm. It could, yeah, she could have been on night shift. All right, time for me to be an old hag, waiting for <laughs> for rowdy boys yeah, to yeah, come cause, through. Well, because all of the other uh, like people in the village, or I guess the like, Grange, or whatever you would call that are um, a little suspicious of her as well. And I, I think they had more stories about her in the in the actual short story. Like, they related more tales of her witchery to the, to the main character. But even in the movie, they described that somebody else was bewitched by her. Yeah, I guess, like, the one point where things come together is the night that he's drinking with the, with the, with the local Ukrainians. Um, right. And uh, the, yeah, there's that one. That's that one bit where there's like the three doors with that guy repeating. That was a that was a fun effect. I thought because I um the like the movie stands on its own regardless of the source material, but it's so close to it that it's very that that it's it's very inviting to to compare yeah. it. But that's like obviously like taken from when he tries to get up, but he's looking around. He sees that there's more doors than there ought to be and that's feel that's like a very like I-, I loved that little bit of prose that that google wrote but he's kind of describing like a very like more like a a psychological impression of a room like i guess like you could put a bunch of doors but it wouldn't read as as well like the movie like has its own spin on it with like having the guy the same guy open the three different doors that are you know a little weirdly close to each other right well, and I like the way that that even conceptually just that scene sort of blurs the line between like witchery and drunkenness. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like you're meant to be like wondering, like, is he inebriated or is he just, um, y- y- you know, or is he is he under the spell of the witch? I think both. Yeah. Like, I think that's important because kind of, a folk, you know, it's the classic folk horror concept of someone from the metropole that goes out into the outskirts where... Uh, like spiritual forces are stronger and you know working against them right and there we see it all together like there's the the background there's already the uh the run with the witch and then like that episode happens because then after that it's like split up like the for the format is you know spooky night day where he tries to escape spooky night day you know, spending time with the villagers, and I—I I don't know, unless I miss something. Like the then it's more segregated, right? Like the night is when you see the magic stuff happen, and then the day it's just 
like him like processing what happened the night before and trying to relate to or escape from the the villagers yeah yeah he seems to be doing that sort of like night shift thing where he's like uh sleeping for part of the day and drinking for the other part of it <laughs> if that makes sense i feel like the the whatever much story there is you see it in the day because like the first two nights so the first night she gets up and kind of like mimes around the wall right right and then she goes back to sleep which is you know a perfect introduction you know that the witch is coming for him the second night what else happened? She just like rides the the coffin like the Silver Surfer, right? And like tries to bump into him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's more intense, you know. She tries to you know bang against the uh, against the like barrier more aggressively, you know. Isn't when she like grazes his hair and makes him blind? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I kind of forgot about that to be honest. That was such a cool effect. That was like in camera. Right. It was a cool moment. It- the way he, the way the actor acted or portrayed that, I kind of forgot or was confused on the blindness aspect of it, though. Yeah, because he didn't act blind. What he did was he came outside and he said, "I must dance," and then he danced. <laughs> uh, so, so I was a little like, oh, oh, I guess blind and dancing, same same thing, depending. Maybe the translation, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's a. I didn't connect those. It just, I thought he was just like losing it, but yeah, maybe there's some kind of Russian pun or something involved in that. He was already compelled to run when, before when he was being ridden by the, by the, by the witch. Yeah, right. Somehow I doubt it. I was just confused why he was never displayed, like shown as being blind, but he was shown as being like a, you know, having dance fever. I I know the (laughs) Saturday night fever, I guess. I know the Greek context, blindness is associated with like this divine wisdom. I think that's how they did it in uh, Elden Ring too. To be honest with you, being Eastern, <laughs> being Eastern Orthodoxy, maybe there's a link. Well, I mean, uh, didn't Odin pluck out his eye for wisdom? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I guess the the wisdom is in this case is just knowledge that I'm fucked. Um, <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> I guess kind of the way I rationalized the blindness um, outside of theme is just. Maybe he was blind for a little bit, and then in the day when when he was outside of the church in the day, he could see. Yeah, because didn't she also make snow fall on his shoulders or something weird? Yeah, I I didn't really follow that either. But they showed they showed it on screen, so I was like, well, yeah, that, that appears to be snow on his shoulders. So at least they gave him a chill. Right, right, right. Maybe that's what the dancing was for—just to like warm him up a little bit, get mm-hmm. the blood flowing. Like you brought up Corbin the his performance. I I I gotta hand it to him because he, that guy's got range. No, that's 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 fair. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, he can play because he's not likable, but like he plays things with such like intensity and urgency that at least you get where he's coming from all the time. He's not likable, but right. I wanted him to maybe get out somehow or but- escape. <laughs> It's hard when everyone seems to be part of this witch conspiracy. I wonder if that's um part of what made the story so um palatable to the Soviet censors was the, is the um just the kind of thing where you have this like this rich nobleman kind of calling the shots and like putting the villagers like maybe like these lumpen you know rural workers like, in a position to like enact like this thing that he's uh unaware of at best about well i think we definitely see like um you know sort of the feudal lord here the one with the power and money is sort of uh you know incompetent and cruel you know mm-hmm. um he, he's using you know, by the end of it, wealth and power to essentially, you know, drive this person to something that they have no interest in doing, you know, I mean, and we are shown these townspeople who are largely normal and seem to yeah. see through a bit of the guise of it, you know, like they'll mm-hmm. tell you firsthand, like, hey, the, 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 the judge or the chief's daughter or whatever is a, is a witch, you know, allegedly. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of things here that fit in with like a, uh, you know, a... a uh, like light Marxist propaganda framework. Like <laughs> y- you're taught to view these landlords and authority figures as a, uh, you know, um, y- you know, like a 
authoritarians and you're taught to sympathize more with these like uh, simple workers you know there's this idea in, like early, early soviet era of like sovietizing i guess like the the outskirts like the outside of russia like they think like the idea that you know, Russia would lead, create this, like, worker state, and then bring other people into the fold. But, you know, but this is pre any of that. So you just see how the different, like, centers of power mm-hmm. just have to kind of live with it. So the the philosopher has to go because the, whatever, the patriarch at the, at the church. Right. The he, like, is part. all about making the connections. and. Right, right, right. A couple times we're shown him sort of a, a you know appraising goods that he's received, aren't we? Yeah, like, like isn't he shown a couple times like judging the quality of some uh, apples or wine or something like that? Yeah. So you know and he's sort of presented as a sort of sort of like this materialist in the same way. Mm-hmm. And he kind of implies some qu- kind of quid pro quo, and then as for the books that so and so wants, tell them I'll you know he'll receive them soon. Right, right. Definitely a villainous character, if not as a overtly <laughs> one as say the the um the father or the uh, the witch herself. But yeah, and again, not like this guy, not like this philosopher guy is so great. Like when he comes back from being ridden like a horse, he goes to where someone's washing and just puts his feet into the <laughs> into the va- into the right, right, right <laughs> where the water is. <laughs> they seem pretty critical of the idea of a figure of philosopher what it's probably another the film seemed pretty critical of of the idea of a person being a philosopher how do you know (laughs) as as a student of the church and and philosophy i guess there's a couple ways you you could parse it out i mean i i think so far what, what i've read of well, I, I guess so, like from the Soviet end, it's like a field of study that lacks praxis and is ultimately a, it's, 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 it's like, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a privileged bourgeois concept to <laughs> pursue philosophy. Have either of you read Crime and Punishment before? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, like in, like, years ago, though, like in high school. Do you remember that crazy ending after he's released from prison? Uh, how'd it go? Uh, about like, um, it's it's like an apocalyptic future where everyone becomes so convinced that they're they've obtained the, the truth or like the ultimate knowledge and just war against <laughs> each other over it. It was it was a bizarre ending, but that also seemed like a critique of philosophy. Yeah, but not but this guy though, the philosopher in the movie, when they ask him like, "What do you study in philosophy? Like, what do you do as a philosopher?" He just does like a trick with a beer with a beer. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, that's yeah. I, I I wasn't sure how literally to take their titles. It seemed more like junior, sophomore, senior. You know what I mean. <laughs> but I because I didn't think of any of them as like what they were literally called. You know what I mean. Like in no way was this guy a philosopher to me. He, he was somebody who was uh, using the the title of philosopher to justify smoking a pipe, perhaps. But uh... <laughs> like philosopher sounds like a highfalutin thing, but he's not a very serious guy. Like he is like a like. He's kind of a goof, like throughout the whole movie. He's still, still a youth, assumably, mm-hmm. or younger. Seems like it's hard being young in in any um, societal context. I guess like the way it was set up, um, like the way the plot was set up, like even from the first night, he had no reason to want to be there. Do, <laughs> they do it. He didn't have a sense of like these are my uh, my duties as a man of the cloth. He's like, well, I gotta be here, so I guess I'll be here. Like he'll he'll just say like nothing can hurt me, and by the end of it, he'll give me a thousand rubles. Nothing can hurt the soul. <laughs> nothing can. No, this is definitely a story about that. Like if you believe nothing can hurt the soul, maybe maybe you'll make it out. I mean, if you were to take that closure of had he had no fear, he would have survived. Nothing hurts a cossack. But that soul. would take like. <laughs> A true Cossack. Maybe that's what the priest should have said in uh, in the Court of the Dragon. 
Yeah, right. It seemed to me that it was less fear that took our philosopher down and more guilt. If you were to, like, I guess, like, make, you know, like, write down all the plot points bit by bit, um, like, that, it seems to go from, like, that's, that feels like the, the appropriate, like, A to B kind of, like, cause and effect uh, storytelling. Um, I'm gonna say what got him wasn't fear or guilt, but a bunch of little guys. Yeah, I think that's fair, no matter what you think of this. <laughs> you know who didn't get him? V. His arms aren't long enough. <laughs> you can't reach. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't even reach this guy. That's what V said. <laughs> I can see him, but you're gonna have to grab him. I can see, but I can't touch. It was. I was impressed he was able to point even. Right. Yeah. What if? What if he was behind him? How would he have pointed at that? He was like, "Oh, hold on, hold on, give me a second. Yeah, let me turn around completely. <laughs> in in slow shuffling motions. Had he tripped and been on his back like a turtle, he could have been like that. Could have been salvation for for our philosopher. Yeah, I get the vibe that if you fall stomach first, though, he's probably actually pretty fast. Like, he's built like a stingray or a cockroach or something. Oh, yeah. Just like Gordon that Ramsay be- when he takes his shirt off. <laughs> that's right. No, that's he's, that's pure muscle. That's that's power. I've said, that's right. I've said before, being bipeds, bipodal is totally a mistake. Having two legs and having a spine totally doesn't work that was that was clearly an improvisation (laughs) freestyling yeah they might have back pain holy hell that's for sure sorry that's 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 a digression (laughs) i think we can leave that one in (laughs) anyway so uh do we have anything else on v or are we ready to sort of uh you know approach our second film here um just like i just want to give a shout out to that last sequence um I guess the last sequence is the guy's talking about. Like when when shit pops off in V, what a spectacle! I really love to see it. Yeah, I like the way that you described little guys. It so much is about all these little guys, <laughs> and it's they're <laughs> phenomenal. Every single one of them. It, you know, it reminds me a little bit of like some of the better scenes in um like like Haxon, You know. Yeah, like that yeah, style yeah. of like costume, the 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 way the rags look and the. The way the the colors the the color scheme simplifies, right, and the way they sort of like move um, uh, awkwardly in that way, like mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. It was it was a really and cool scene. They have special effects with the way they come in too. Like there are like these like stop motion or puppet moments, or they like do things where like they reverse footage. So like the frame rate gets kind of weird, like how it would on like on a silent movie or something too. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking of the one where like a, a big guy and a little guy emerge from cobwebs <laughs> like in, in tandem and it's like, oh, that's sick. But Yeah. And then when the bit like I just love the look when those hands are coming out of the ground. The compositing on that must have been painstaking. Right, amazing. right. Cause they do it too, like the camera's revolving and then these hands coming out. Right. Plus yeah, plus all the all the fucked up little guys running around. <laughs> Can't forget about the guys. <laughs> this this is a side note, kind of. I appreciated every zoom in of the oh terrifying pissed off eye yeah. kind of Jesus. Oh yeah, that's a really good. Uh, that's a good that point. Was, I forgot. That was to, a I, really I, yeah, cool I almost forgot effect. to mention that. That's really cool. I like that. That's right. When I was watching the movie, every time it happens, like, oh, I gotta. This is definitely gonna come up. Icons in orthodoxy, very neat. Yeah, just in general, it makes sense for that to have so much um, presence given. Like, I understand that icons are a big deal for Eastern Orthodox. Um, but also, like, even if you didn't know anything about it, if you have this set, you... Like, that's an intense-looking Jesus. <laughs> and, like, those are some intense-looking images like you you know she's yeah. gonna go down when the jesus in your church looks that, that <laughs> i angry. think that teases at like this like underlying theme for all of it almost that like um 
I don't know, like, in the same way that, like, um, the philosopher sort of, like, cast the salt circle around himself, he also, you know, purports to lead a holy life, right? But the way that Jesus just glares at him, it just <laughs> almost implies that he, you know, it, like, Jesus knows that you don't, right? And the the, the salt circle is only going to hold up for so long, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's like the, the real evil is the evil in our hearts all along, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's, but, a, it's a definitely judgmental Jesus. I mean, no, it's a, I know it's an old story, so it's been known. And it's also something that you expect, but it feels like it should be transgressive for there to be a bunch of devils in the church. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It, it, I like the scene where they emerge, too, because it kind of implies that they've been there the whole time. Like, very few of them appear to emerge from outside the church, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of them are just hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> and hiding the, in cobwebs, I, evidently. Yeah. <laughs> Have either of you watched uh, like the first season of Castlevania on Netflix, or is, is that a little casual? I know I saw I know I know I saw it once. I I saw up to does Dracula die? I think I saw Dracula die. So one one of my favorite scenes is the the bishop that caused these whole chain of events to happen. He was hiding in in the church and the. You know, some demon walks in, and you know this bishop, this uh, archdiocese figure is like, "Oh, why, why are you in here? This is a holy place." And the demon gives like a really dark reply, like, "Oh, God isn't oh. watching here. Like this, this, <laughs> this church is no longer holy because you, you are in it." <laughs> Damn, God! Oh, so you're depending on who, who occupies the space? This corrupted philosopher Pharisee, like can church really be that's kind of like a place of protection it's kind of like the king in yellow you know what i mean that's like his ruminations in a in the, in the court of the dragon or yeah about know. uh about like the churches that aren't fully con um i was gonna say constant whatever like blessed right right like i I, I think, like, the, the theme here is that, like, no religious doctrine could ever be flawless in a way that lets no evil in. But I, I don't know that that's a super deep take, you know? <laughs> yeah, it just, like, it... Either way, like, V, like, creates a world where I'm not... Like, the, the circle did take, so I guess there's something there, but... Until it didn't. Until it didn't. Until it didn't, but... Yeah, it creates a world where like these there are other forces besides the ones you're traditionally taught. Um, I I wonder like um, the he's definitely someone who's worthy of punishment by at least someone's metrics. Do you think in the world of V, if he had been an upstanding philosopher or whatever, uh, he would have been saved by God? Uh. Yes and no. I mean, like, I, I, I think, um, I, I, I think in a literal sense, probably not. But I think, because uh, again, I, I don't think the evil that threatened him was until the very end, the entities in the church, right? I, I think it was like his own evilness. You know what I mean? Like, I think that if um, he had been a more upstanding philosopher, he wouldn't have, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't be raiding uh, food on his way out of <laughs> That's town. That's true. He wouldn't have been put into the position anyway in the right. first place. He wouldn't have been insisting on, um, you know, staying with this old woman. He wouldn't have tried to steal from her. He wouldn't have, uh, <laughs> you know, he might have just run away when he escaped from her instead of beating the ever-living piss out of her. I, I mean... I, I even in church when he goes to uh, pray, we're, we're given many scenes where he starts to pray and then he, he uh, <laughs> s- you know snorts some tobacco or something. Do you know what I mean? Like that that's what Jesus is so pissed about. You know, I, at least I, I, the... I like that scene. That scene was <laughs> well. Hey, shit! So I would do the same I thing. I, I, you know, no complaints. But like, if you're asking me, like, what is Jesus pissed about? Like, what is it that killed him? You know what I mean? It's uh, it's the evil within the circle, not outside it. Rotten to begin with. Right, I mean, ev- evil or not, this guy is so in- embedded in-, in the context. But on that note, speaking of people embedded in evil, uh, and the judgment of God, do you want to move on to the next 
to the next movie? Oh, I reckon we oughta. It's gonna be about that time. Any more V like my any more in final V thoughts? All I got to offer is that you know it's a good time. Like it's a fun movie with like really nice visuals and good pacing. To bring a bag of bag of popcorn. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think in terms of, was... like, uh, you know, of the two movies we watched for this, um, this one is a is, is a, a much more of a movie, if that makes sense. <laughs> like, it's got the narrative structure. It's, a, you know, it's a good watch uh, with a family, with a, with a, with a significant other. Yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, this one I can see working. I'm so happy it was on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Also. Oh, yeah, PSA. Um um i guess most film is still going is still ongoing it survived the the fall and they put the movie up on youtube that's where you can watch it in russian because on shutter you can only get it with an english dub there's actually a bunch of stuff on uh moss film i was looking i mean I, you know i don't know how much of like soviet weebs we want to be like as you said <laughs> but i you know there's a lot of stuff a lot of there russian is. film available on youtube uh, I, I've, I've, I've since learned but there's some stuff i was curious about when i was scrolling through it too yeah yeah we'll, we'll have to do some research and uh, maybe add a couple of those to our list uh revisit that <laughs> Oh, for sure. Uh, 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 for the audience out there, uh, comment comment below f- what your favorite Soviet film is. Comment below if your eyelids are long and heavy and drag on the ground. <laughs> yeah, how's that? Is this good representation? Comment <laughs> comment below. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mad God. What a fucked up <laughs> movie. I think that's the that's the first start. Like V, I think could work for almost any crowd, right. except for like people who are allergic to subtitles. Um, <laughs> Mad God, like that's a that's an acquired taste. Yeah, that's that's for sure. I wasn't I wasn't sure if I had it, but <laughs> it, it it hooked me enough where I, I got through the whole thing. I had a big squeamish moment about halfway through, but then I, I powered through it, you know, because it isn't my first go round. Yeah, uh, I guess I had, I had some familiarity with Tool music videos and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know the pieces fit. <laughs> How long are those? You put it. You, you know, put enough of them together. If you take it like this, could be this could be just a bunch of music videos <laughs> strung together. Yeah. yeah, you know, for a band that's never really made any music, I don't like. I really detest Tool. <laughs> that's don't fair. Cut I that mean, out. leave that in. No, <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck them. Right. <laughs> uh, there's a. There's like a thing I'm making fun of Tool that's like um, listening to Tool and using my STEM major brain to imagine a perfect dodecahedron. <laughs> oh my god! Oh hey, um, I listened to I listened to Twenty Jazz Funk Greats. Oh yeah, it's no horse rotor Vader, but it's it's all right. I I love the song Persuasion on that album. Yeah, that song is good. Like that's the only one I could name. Obviously, because like the one that also has like the the words matching what's happening in it yeah so it's that, easy to single out but i felt like he was sincerely trying to convince me something convince me of something it makes you think like the thing about like there's something weirdly invasive 
about going, you know, speaking worse to someone and making the contents of their minds change. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. That's like a game of capture the flag with their, like, deepest thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, the way he's just, like, so, like, sing-songy about it and, like, so, like, you know, sickly sweet. It, it's, like, that one, like, is, like, chilling to me. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. You a big fan of industrial music, Corbin? Like industrial dance and yeah, I, I would I would say I like an industrial. There you go. But I, I should I should explore it more. Yeah, it's it's a cool sure. genre. You like the the sounds themselves? Oh yeah, oh for sure the the, the sound effects are, are are neat. It's I'm I'm, I'm no I'm no music um <laughs> theorist. That, that's not the right word. Me neither, dude. I'm <laughs> I'm open to recommendations though. Yeah, so, like, if industrial dance is, like, taking, like, industrial, like, sound effects and, like, um, pulling them together to make, like, a, like, a cohesive song, uh, this is such a strange, <laughs> uh, Mad God is kind of, like, finding these sounds, finding these things, these discarded images, pulling them together, but farther away from this is less less more far away from the dance end of the spectrum cool cool yeah i liked it um i well i i I was gonna ask if you wanted to summarize it but i don't know how you would summarize okay so what i thought to do is i did a little bit of preparation i just wrote down kind of a an outline of like the things that happen and I figure we can just do this like a little tour. So, you know, like we're getting on the uh, Mad God Express. And at any point, he can pull pull on the stop, slow down, and take in the sights. That, that sounds that sounds agreeable. Let's let's have fun at Divers Bell. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's begin our our descent without getting the order. So it starts out with a Bible quote and a and an image. Where it looks like a bunch of I'm going to use this wonderful phrase, like going back. I think this is a neat coincidence that we did this with V. Uh, we see a bunch of little guys working on the on the Tower of Babel. And some dark clouds roll in. And we see a, yeah, a really hardcore Leviticus quote talking about how God's going to like destroy destroy the land, destroy kingdom so much that like Nothing grows on it. Everyone suffers. Like, yeah, let's go through this tour now. So the movie starts with um, like a, like a little um, what do you call it? Like a diving chamber, descending from the sky, with a little soldier in it. There's a a fortress where these turrets are trying to shoot it down, but it makes it through. And then we see then and we see a descent through, um, like these fossilized bones. And some some strange statues until till it lands and a soldier comes out. He looks at a map and he starts going through level one, uh, like the opening area, the tutorial zone. It's like this kind of like dusty, wait, rust. This dusty, rusty wasteland where we see a um, a kind of a house in the distance. You can kind of see in the windows, there's some, like, debauchery happening. A li- a, there's a little monkey guy that's, like, fishing for little lizards. I guess he just, like, lives in a barrel, tries to eat the lizards. But he get, grabs the attention of of some warden at the big house who then goes and chops up the monkey. We see our, our, our soldier guy kind of just use that distraction to just keep moving because he's on his mission. He walks past a room where it seems like a monkey's being tortured. And there's some other animals in a, like in cages. And there's a doll that's touching yeah, itself. Straight, straight yeah, it's like a... <laughs> Flicking the bean. And we just see it. He closes the door. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I just, I, it's, it's heartbreaking when he closes the door on the monkey and the monkey's like, whatever little bit of hope that that monkey had that he was gonna be saved. 
<laughs> right. Oh, oh, heartbreaking. Anyways, he moves on from that, and we get to level two, I believe, which is like an industrial plant where these um, uh, these little husk people are like molded and put out to to do this endless work. It looks like they're rebuilding the Tower of Babel, and we see them just like being destroyed in sometimes funny slapstick ways, like an anvil dropping on them, or them being squished like by some domino bricks or we see them otherwise just like looking into a fire getting burnt falling in and a line of them just doing that right a real sense of expendability yeah um do you remember like that one's the most (laughs) i wanted to Uh ask you this because i think i might have missed this detail um i think above that at one point he's like he walks past a series of uh like things right like creatures you know strapped to chairs that are being electrocuted and then shitting. Do you remember yeah, that? I wasn't. Ma- oh no, I definitely remember that. I the, I thought that might have been later, but maybe it was. That was a well, brutal <laughs> scene. Oh god. Well, it was right before that, right? And I wasn't oh, okay. sure a hundred percent, but I thought that the. No, little, I think you're right. I think you're right. I thought that the little husk guys were made out of that shit. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, he does. He he escapes after the monkey gets eaten. The the other one the one with the with the, without legs right yeah and then he goes into like these like mechanical sewers and yeah he walks past like these giant people being electrocuted shit oh man like that was like i know you talked about i know we talked in the chat like what the gross part was for you to me that was like the well I th- like peak gross i found that whole sequence incredibly evocative because it, it um it, it, it's like this society uh, where you're created by a god who's being tortured to essentially live a life of torture. I, do you know what I mean? Because I was like, oh, so they're they're like scrapped together from the shit of God. You know what I mean? And then and then forced <laughs> to just die. Dude, I was like, holy shit! Like, yeah, it's uh, just like different like layers upon layers of of suffering that depend on like the layer beneath or the layer above to keep it going. Right, right, right. Kind of feels like extreme capitalism taken to its greatest possible right. end. Yeah. Yeah, with those husks, but it's starting, yeah, but it right, so you have those people in the house that are living that that are living comfortably with some brute like making sure no one intrudes on them. Yeah, and then below we get, like, a bunch of people are being electrocuted so that they'll, like, shit their brains out. And then that shit goes into these people that are strapped with their mouths open so that they'll, like, the shit will fall into their mouths. And then we go, then, yeah, the little guy's going, the other soldier man's going down that, like, an elevator. And we say, like, these people eating the shit, they don't, they're just, like, um, a head. And then they're... Their throat gives way to like these like these biological tubes, like just like these um I don't know, like this processing equipment for this nasty stuff. Yeah, and I think you're right. Then that stuff like fall goes in and gets molded into those husk people that are Yeah, probably like the <laughs> this incredibly expendable. Right? Just the the most grotesque ask like to act of creation I've ever seen. Like, oh my god. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like a like nothing makes sense, but there's just enough connection sometimes between the different things, right? That like it's a really surreal Rube Goldberg of suffering. Oh my god, yeah. I was just gonna say it's really impressive to do all this with clay claymation and stop motion or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I was like, holy shit! You know, like no wonder this oh, took so yeah. long. Because, yeah, there's, like, a lot of techniques at play. Because there's the stuff that's um, done with clay and chicken wire. And then there's, um, you know, like, more complicated figures. Right. And, like, the scene where the scene where he's walking past those people being electrocuted. And you get this, like, camera that's kind of below tracking the guy walking. Uh-huh. And you just, like, see the feet. Like, so, like, they, like, took all that stuff. They, they must have composited it and timed the camera to move at the same time. And you get it from like different angles, because it wasn't like they made a giant, giant puppets that are to scale with that thing. They probably like, you know, shot them at their scale and then shot the other person at a farther away, you know, 
you, you know, using wider lens from farther away. Right, right, right. And then, like, put them together. So here's a Wikipedia fact. Apparently, it's not just stop motion. It's Phil Tippett is known for pioneering go motion. Huh. What's that? Um, taking the photo, like, for each individual frame, taking the photo with the figure somehow moving, either using, like, like animatronic technolo- technology, like, move the limbs while the thing's moving, or while the camera's, um, like, taking the photo while it's, expo- while it's exposing, so that you'll get the motion blur. Oh, wow. Oh. Sometimes with the stop motion, it's a little bit stop smart, but it stop start, but it's a little smoother if you get the motion blur. Huh. Because I was going to say, there were some really smooth scenes in there. You know what I mean? Things that I was like, is this actually stop motion? But <laughs> So much expertise in, involved in that. That's for, for how long? 30 like years. Over 30 years? <laughs> uh, like on and off, apparently. Yeah, because he's, what, he shelved it after mm-hmm. Jurassic Park. Some supporters were like, oh, please, please finish yeah, this. Yeah, like, no, this. we need this nasty shit. Like, <laughs> we, need, we need to see where this nasty shit goes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy that stop animation or go motion techniques can summon so much emotion and and disgust. Like 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 the, the things I hold it back from being like nonstop beauty is like the live action parts didn't really work for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit that I kind of agreed with that. Though I think the thing that I found the grossest in the whole movie was the scene where he's pulling the jewelry out of the Oof. the main character's stomach. That was, like, yeah. so horrifically gory to me. I was like, yo, this is, like, this is going to make me nauseous <laughs> if it goes on for even two more minutes. And the way it blended with, like, uh, you know, because it was an actual guy at that point, you know what I mean? Like, they actually mm-hmm. got a guy in there, you know? But Yeah, and maybe, like, the, the timing for that does help to make it land more. Right. Then yeah, because like my yeah okay well well I guess we'll move on with the tour. So so we see this uh, exploitation carnival, this industrial, sort of nonstop. Part of the, tech part of the uh, machinery of it. I'm not sure how much of it is part of its function, or if it's just um part of the malice or part of the um, sadism of of it all. There's like this um. Titty ball sack monster that's like shitting everywhere that's pushing them around. <laughs> yes, titty ball sack monster is 100% correct. <laughs> There's no other thing you can call okay. that. That's exactly what it is. Like, okay. <laughs> if, if the viewers were to see a picture of it, they would see exactly a titty ball sack monster, and there's no other way to put it. <laughs> like, um, anyways, there's that thing that's pushing these little husks around, stomping on them. There's baby sounds coming out of these loudspeakers, and there's this giant floating TV thing that's like close up of a mouth and eyes, kind of spouting noises. It gives it a, a an apocalyptic feel. I'm not sure if the baby noises are just to taunt them, or if it's like a thing about like how you motivate people. Like think of the baby. You're doing this for the baby. See, I got the sense that they had like an overlord that, that was so. uh, speaking to them in baby talk, essentially. Like, or um, yeah, I, I I took that as a pretty straightforward metaphor for like dystopian society. You know what I mean? Um, like that whole segment with the with the husk guys. I I I, mm-hmm. I took it as like um maybe like oh I I I sort of thought it was like meant to be sort of like a uh, you know like a leader who is um you know not mm-hmm. competent. You know, like a like a yeah. like these cl- these clowns in Congress, so to speak. You, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, just just all they know all they know to do is is rile people up. They can't make Tower Babel. Right. Well, and I mean, all a baby does is babble. So oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so think... what are we even doing this for? Yeah. Like the futility and all of it. Less of an awesome take. I I thought other movies of this genre when trying to scare audiences would use baby noises more uh more (laughs) low-key in their soundtracks like it's just like somewhere far away a baby's crying because just because you know it's (laughs) yeah it's 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 like more it's like more sub subliminal but like I've, i've heard before that when 
horror movie directors were trying to elicit a scare, they, they would do mm-hmm. that low key. No, it's very in your face. Yes. Like yeah, like like this movie's not interested in subtlety. I, I thought maybe there was a connection there. No, no. No, I love that. Okay, well, anyways, it looks like the our soldier guy. I think the credits call him the assassin. Uh, it looks like he's considering taking one of the husks with him, and but then decides not to risk it, not to risk an encounter with the titty ball sack monster. You can't you can't fuck and... around with the titty ball sack monster. <laughs> But I think that takes us to, like, a dark room. He goes down. He steps on a little worm. And we see that there's, like, a mechanical spider maybe stalking him. And he gets to this room full of briefcases, like his. He opens his up, and it's a time bomb that he sets up. While he's fiddling around with it, or just, like, waiting for it to go off, the the spider takes him. And we see the the clock tick all the way up to when it's about to go. And then it stops and it starts going back one second and forward, back and forth. And I think that's a cut. That's a cut to our favorite sequence. We see uh, some doctors in front of an audience um, take off all their clothes, maybe even his skin. Would you say? I don't know. Like, yeah, it was hard to tell. I, I thought I thought so. Yeah, we see this in a silhouette. But then what they do is they he's strapped to a table. He doesn't seem to have eyelids to close his eyes. He just sees as the doctors come in, they cut him open, and they start pulling out, like, these gold chains, jewelry. It's, like, really na- like <laughs> out of, like, the- his inner jelly. Um, then he pulls out, like, some books. He looks at it briefly, throws it out. While I was watching this, I was like, oh, they're after the the jewelry. But they were throwing it out in so-, so casually. Okay, maybe not. And then he looks at the book. and like, okay, we're done. He-, he was looking for the book. Um, but then he's like throwing out the pages too, until he pulls out like a like a crying baby worm, and he hands that to the nurse, and the nurse takes it away. Oh, you know what I missed is I think he's like looking. He, there's like a scene where he's like looking at the clock, and they, it, it keeps zooming in the clock, and the second hand moves slower and slower. That was a neat like if you know if animation you know is expression through movement like that is just like the the, the simplest version of like how much can emotion can you get out of waiting for something to go from point a to point b to physically move time just like dilates more and more it was, it was a neat call back to the uh the failed suitcase bomb that that'd be all that's on my mind so like every 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 clicking time uh, yeah i clocks were such a reoccurring theme throughout this whole film mm-hmm. i wasn't sure how to interpret that you know relative to the plot but it seems like really really relevant somehow yeah, besides just the um, the setup of uh, the time bomb, yeah, you know, imminent apocalypse, like imminent reckoning. Right, right, right. It's almost like that twenty-four sound <laughs> effect. Was that what that show was 24? called? Twenty-four. Oh yeah, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Else, else, I don't know. Okay, this might be a stretch, but um, twenty-four is a digital clock, and you see it go to zero. And with the analog clock, it's a circle, right? That just keeps going. Like, there's a point you're waiting yeah. for. But, you know, I guess as we'll see, like, what comes after that, it's just another another uh, revolution. Like, another uh, go around the circle. Either, okay, so, so they pull out the, uh, the books, they pull out the baby worm, which I guess is what they were looking for. And then they drill into his head, and we, and we look into a TV... Where we get, um, I'm not sure if we're to take this as a flashback. I I was super unclear on that. <laughs> I, I was super unclear on that because it's framed like a f- flashback, but you get the sense that it's occurring like uh like like as a new thing. Yeah, maybe it's like a flashback up to a point. So I'll just say like what we see is we go into the TV and we get a we get one of the soldiers looking into a castle that is. Like being kind of raided by zombies or being like, see, like besieged, and is occupied by satanic Nazis. Classic. Like, <laughs> I was rooting for the assassin guy, and then it turns out that they're th- satanic Nazis. Just like anyone Wait, I j- in the NFT business. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the head NFT uh, satanic satanic Nazi is this is um, this guy with really long fingernails. We see him like go about his business. He he waits for the he waits for um, these uh, these these fates to weave together in a map. I was trying to think of what the word was for doing the Bitcoin algorithm, like doing the oh, uh, doing <laughs> crypto mining, crypto mining. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's yeah, he he wait. He's, these fates are crypto mining <laughs> to, and they finish their algorithms to to weave together this map, which he then takes, you know, past a bunch of the soldiers. To give to one of them, um, so that they can be sent out into the in through the diving bell, and it goes down like through into like some kind of liquid, and we see the Mister Fingernails and go into a special room where he's like kind of observing and go down with radar equipment. We see another uh, bit of the uh, clock like motif, the spinning, you know, instrument of measurement. So this is where like at some point there's a there's a deviation or it's a cyclical thing. But uh, we follow a soldier go down, you know, go go down in this diving chamber and come out. And he's in this apocalyptic city that's being like this desolate, empty place being destroyed by a big virus. Fake news. I, I got big, um, like, toy soldier vibes from that scenery. To- toy soldiers? You mean just like the toys or like... Um, yeah, well, I, I guess both. Like, everything seems so big, and, and like, like the, the characters are so miniaturized. Yeah, the scale does open up. So he first he like finds a bicycle. It breaks up down. It breaks down. He finds a a motorcycle, and he drives out for a bit through the through these through the empty city. The next bit I have here is that he like drives past like these. Like this desert full of mushroom clouds. Oh, um, saw a tank battle. Tank battle. <laughs> Sorry. That was probably. I mean, that was, was the most like. This just kind of looks cool. Like it. I guess like coming off of what it, you know, Things coming off cool. of what we saw in the last little soldiers run, right. like seeing metal be destroyed in explosions, just kind of looks cool and less hellish than. Um, I don't know. Pick any of the things that we described earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was literally just a tank battle. It almost seemed out of place. <laughs> <laughs> the the body gore kind of really stepped back for a while after. Yeah, that's definitely true. That halfway mark on the surgeon's table, I thought. Yeah, I guess just first it needs to shock you, and then then I guess you get a, a wider view of things. Right. Or maybe maybe we became more uh, like desensitized, tolerant of, of it. Yeah, I don't hard to say. Yeah, like this person's this 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 little soldier's journey seems a little more pleasant. The bike runs out of whatever. Like the bike breaks down, and he gets on a on a truck, and he makes a point to like like when the radio starts playing to beat it until it, he's driving in silence, and. He gets to this, to this, um, like descending spiral that he's driving down. As he's going down it, it fades out, and we go back to the woman carrying the the worm baby, who she gives who, oh, so she she gets to like this giant like door that opens up, and out of the darkness comes out a Dark Souls um, boss, a Dark Souls boss, <laughs> plague, Virgo the wet nurse, plague doctor, yeah, for. If you've played Bloodborne, you've seen Murgo the wet, wet, the wet nurse, or Murgo's wet nurse. It's that. It looks like she's we- she's wearing a like a, a plague doctor mask, the beaked plague mask. You know, it's it's appropriate that it be a wet nurse, considering. Yeah, I I wonder like when in the thirty year development of it it was. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Let me look up. Let me look up what that character looks like again. Um, yeah, the best I can describe it, if anyone else ha- wants to give it a shot, is like a tall, like a tall shroud of loose black fabric under a hat. 
that uh, from which is also hanging like bones and charms as a kind of curtain and peeking out of it is a plague mask and these big meaty hands these big little these big troll hands uh yeah i was looking i was just looking at the pictures yeah they do look pretty similar oh you're looking at murgo's wet nurse yeah yeah do you want to give a shot at, at a description of Margot's wet nurse? <laughs> of, of any of them. Like, I feel like it's fun to... Um, I guess as we go, if you want, if anyone wants to give a shot at putting into words some of this imagery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say, if anyone wants to give a shot describing the titty ball sack monster. But uh, it's... <laughs> I don't know what you can say beyond Teddy Ballsack Monster. I know at one point there's a little there's a little guy made out of like a string or a, or, or rubber that appears out of nowhere yeah. <laughs> and sort of tickles his butthole till he shits in his face. Shits any? <laughs> um, but that's uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's that's the only little bit that's missing. It has, it has the equipment for shitting on, like very violently shitting on someone's face. Yeah, apparently periodically it needs to have its butthole tickled. Uh, it seems like more of like a maintenance thing than like a biological thing. Yeah. It, just, it needed to have its butthole tickled. <laughs> Anyways, Virgo's wet nurse. So we'll, right. we'll call this one... Um, yeah, we can just call her the wet nurse. Right, I like that. Is it that. fair to gender... Yeah, whatever, the wet nurse... Um, takes the baby. Yeah, well, cause it, cause it serves the function of a, of a wet nurse in the movie. So it sort of just makes sense to call it. That. Yeah. Just, yeah, get this, uh, newborn thing, prepare it. Right. Transport it. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, she takes, she, yeah, she's a she girl. She's a girl boss. She's doing, she's getting ahead. Um, the wet nurse takes the ba- the worm baby through um uh through like a very secure kind of uh series of landscapes first we see like these giant bricks that close behind her and open up only right in front of her and she walks through them all she I walks really through like these that. yeah it looked satisfying or looked um it yeah pristine. it was really good i like looking at the bricks like, yeah and it was also like imposing like there's something mysterious, alien, and strong about it. like like it like. It reminded me of like how a lock works, you know. Oh yeah. With like tumblers and uh, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. Like, uh, you get the sense that once you know, once something is on the other side of it, you know what I mean. It's it's safe there. You know, it's protected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It was this. It seemed high tech and like tight. Yeah, tight as fuck. Oh, yeah, but also like the. The way it was so many, like, bricks, the way it, like, shrunk her in the landscape, it felt so um, imposing, too. Like, it felt like, out of just squares, like, out of just, like, these bricks, like, it felt like, um, like, I'd almost want to compare it to, like, a Giger painting. Yeah, yeah. I guess I gotta hand it to him. Like, they really did it with that. Uh, yeah, she walks through these uh, gates with... Um, these red eye bull uh, sculptures that like like their gaze follows her as she walks in. She walks past some uh, looks like a a display of like a big paramecia or at least a big video of paramecia and some ocean life. And I I guess we cut away at some point to these monsters that are like um hitting each other with shovels in this big like shit pile and they're they're fighting each other until this little guy comes up and gives them like a shock that like causes them a lot of pain and then it keeps shocking them going like to like higher and higher levels and it does a little laugh and when then when he's done when he's done with that the monsters go back to shoveling the shit and we get a montage of them throwing the throwing clumps of I assume it's poop. Oh, it's throwing true. the poop into like like these big wally towers of poop, and until some some more poop falls out, falls down from I guess uh, the the machinery up top, and 
it pisses off one of them so much, it pokes out the other monster's eye out, and they go back to fighting. Then we follow the little guy who had given them the shock, and he goes to his little laboratory. Uh, he feeds these, um, these little, these little animals, and we go into the world from their perspective in their terrarium and looks like idyllic. They're like eating their worms and it's very colorful and the music it's like psychedelic and fun. I I <laughs> love the coloration of, of that little terrarium. Yeah. yeah. Very pretty. And especially coming off of everything else, it was such a relief to see this like nice area. It seemed like a relief. It was it was Un- yeah. Un- <laughs> it was brief. Yeah. Until the um the little guy presses a switch, a trapdoor opens, and a slightly bigger little guy spider, spider thing. yeah, comes comes up and so the the little pets that were eating the worms, it looked like one was maybe a mom and the other was a kid. Um but anyways, the older one like runs away and leaves the little one. <laughs> leaves the little one behind. And the spider takes it away and the the older pet just goes, Oh no! I think that's like the only spoken line in the movie. Yeah, you know what it is. See, I wasn't know <laughs> I was I didn't know if it was a spoken line or if it was just some random sound effect. Well not random, <laughs> but just like that that that's what everyone is feeling at that moment. It it felt like just like the random like whatever little words Mario sometimes allowed to speak. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> oh. Um, so tell Mario to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, man, that was such a th- I thought so I was thinking like sometimes I have this like no pun intended this pet theory about the way that animals are pampered. I think it's because of a genuine love people feel for their pets, of course, but I think it's also like, you know, in a you know, in an endless industrial, you know, capitalist hellscape, you know, like this, like nonstop stress, like driving through ugly asphalt, you know, strip malls, going to your shitty job or whatever, like coming back, you can see an animal, like you can see something you care about in serenity and be so like I, when I was watching, it's like, oh, this is kind of like this pet theory I have, like it's, it's a sense of relief to see the you know like a beautiful creature in 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 leisure like a cat in the sun is just pleasing right. um but no like this little guy is a little sadist he i guess the spider thing's got to eat too but i got a sense that he liked to see the the other things in peril he gives yeah, he doesn't he giggle a bit i feel like he giggled yeah a bit. he did a little giggle <laughs> yeah I mean, maybe he was happy for the spider thing. It seemed like his. I want to believe you. I want to believe you, Corbin. I really do. That I, I think he had a genuine care for the, uh, the spider pet thing. Yeah. Not so much in seeing the other pets be tortured. Well, I, I, I guess he must. Though it seems weird that he would give them the nice habitat then, and then let's keep the spider in a cage in the basement. <laughs> I don't know, maybe keeping it as comfortable as possible. Fair. As 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 far as the shitty monsters characters go in, in uh Mad God, this this one seems a little more neutral. <laughs> Fair. I don't I wanna believe you, but he did also laugh when he shocked the big monsters. That's Yeah, he seems like kind of a motherfucker, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed a little uh Sad and melancholic wa- walking back to what, what I assume is uh, his home. No, I think he just walked like that because his body's all fucked up. Yeah, boy, Corbin, that's, really playing devil a- devil's advocate that, on this that's, one. That's, that's also a take. <laughs> no, may, may, maybe, I'm project- maybe I'm projecting what I wa- finally wanted to see after how, how long we're, were we watching this at, at that point. You know, after an hour of... E- yeah. <laughs> evil and torture maybe a little bit of good yeah but either way what regardless of whatever his source of pleasure is in this whole scenario uh he's got to get back to work he starts cleaning up he's dusting he's organizing the books 
seems um gets really filthy in there when he's sweeping the floor it looks sticky um and just in time because uh the wet nurse walks in through the door and with the baby so the the little the little guy pulls out a book the wet nurse consults it then takes the baby presses it in a machine and then the goo falls into another machine that then processes the goo and, and it looks like it comes out as mercury that's poured into a into a mold comes out as a like a brick like an ingot and the the little guy then takes that brick crushes it up into like glitter um gives the shiny powder to the wet nurse and then she takes that powder and throws it into a vortex we see into the vortex and we get first space like Odyssey. a beautiful sw- we get a space yeah we get the stargate sequence for the movie um so we see i'm gonna rush through these whatever i remember anyone else want to throw in things we first we see some swirling a swirling glitter storm and then that like um blows up and we see like uh space maybe we see some planets aligning and an alien walking past like walk and and, and, and a, like a classic saucer spaceship fly past it it looks like um an ingot lands on one of the planets and like this redness spreads through it then we zoom into that we see some biological things seem to take shape and i guess it's like a world being made we see buildings sort of like rise up and they're like in this design where they seem to have like these like electrical spokes coming out of them the one of the buildings culminates in um in a radio antenna that goes out and we see a full glimpse of the city and it's already looking kind of kind of crappy these little girl anarchists are planning a bomb uh they get the uh, spotlight shines on them and they run away, but the bomb explodes. What else do we see? Um, I, I think that was it for that sequence, but I, <laughs> I, I thought it was really interesting that they used the monolith from uh, Space Odyssey to like uh, sort of symbolize like uh, something with the power to like create a world. Yeah. It, it, it looked like they were attempting to do a redo at the whole endeavor of creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah separate from the mad god yeah i wasn't sure that was like a universe within a universe or yeah that's kind of how i took it universe within a universe yeah maybe the monoliths that fell onto the planet we see a couple flying around i think they look like the ingots made from the uh worm baby extract Mm -hmm. i don't like there it really felt like everything was being like thrown up (laughs) right Oh, <laughs> and then I'm not sure what the visual connection. I don't know if we get out of that vision of a world being created and blown up or if, oh, we see some like uh, mushroom clouds, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So we think we just like, we see a descent right uh, into, into a man-made apocalypse. And the last thing we see is that the, uh, that, that time bomb, the, the, the clock for some reason works again it ticks up to the last second a, a, a cuckoo clock a cuckoo bird like come like you know cuckoo, the, the cuckoo from a clock comes out um i don't remember if there's like a little bit of visuals between and we last thing we see is the fingernails man looking down at the pool where the diving thing went into and i believe that's how it ends yep that is how it ends <laughs> like that's like where most friends like just like images get thrown out right bro i think he's the mad god the guy with the fingernails and who's left to be the mad god at- i thought so too so yeah i mean it seems like he's above the mall like i think it like just given that the thing descends down into the other world right and then they're building their tower in, yeah. in that direction so with that and with the like with the allusion to not the allusion to the, the the Leviticus quote, we see yeah, we have this person that's over everything, 
blowing it up, but also giving them the the raw materials to make things again. Yeah, yeah. Huh. You know, I I didn't consider that. I you know when I when they were getting the uh, when they're pulling out that worm, mm-hmm. I thought they were like getting one over on the assassin, but maybe it's just part of one big dance. Right, right. Damn, yeah, that's really. Huh. Yeah, you've really cast a different light on this because I hadn't drifted anywhere near this interpretation that you're suggesting, but I really like it. So I mean, I I took as two really fucked up sides <laughs> one with the mad god and one with this hellish version of what was once humanity warring against this demiurge mm. then you have these couple parties here like the the wet nurse and the fucked up little dude <laughs> trying to find another way another resolution yeah like if um and that resolution was trying to recreate things yeah, like, like if the mad god is like sheer destruction, like um, like the the society that's below is like uh, um, like trying to like reappropriate like the you know what it brings, like the these tools or like and like kind of like become like a mirror image to it. Yeah, it's, it's still like it's still like it's tough to like um to put a bow on it. Like it, I, like it feels it feels really close to like um. Like, I'm very tempted to want to, like, make a schematic with arrows pointing in different directions. Like, this contributes to that. And, like, this goes over here. Like, it, it makes me want to look at it as if it's, like, one big machine. Yeah, like a, like an actual, uh, what is it, Rube's Goldberg or whatever. Or, yeah. Gold, what's the word I'm looking for? It was, it was very... Rube Goldberg? Yeah, that's it. I didn't want to say Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I was getting close. Ruth Bader It's one big Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, just a giant Ruth Bader Ginsburg machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like this like horrible thing that refuses to die until it's too late. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Um, going back to like like the poor like I just keep thinking about the people stuck in the middle. Yeah, the husks. Like the the assassin, the husks. And the assassin guys seem to have a little bit of compassion, like the way it like stopped to look at some of this stuff and when it comes down to it like i don't want to pick either side like worst case scenario is that it all starts over again yeah i did get the sense that in some way it has to be cyclical like it's all cyclical in it you know Mm -hmm. even the way that they show us two descents by the assassin just made it seem like the whole thing is doomed to repeat quasi infinitely you know yeah like, maybe the character of it changes in some way that makes the Mad God victorious in this instance, but, like, it's not, you know, it's not the end for anybody. Mm-hmm. Though, uh, pretty soon it is going to be the end for me, because I'm starting to get sleepy. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we got, yeah, let's, on that, on that note of uh, the eternal pun, of uh, the eternal suffering that life on earth is <laughs> doomed to repeat over and over again right we are we are really into eternal suffer, suffering as a book club aren't we it seems to be our yeah uh, with this harlan ellison it's like damn we like to suffer yeah yeah mad god feels like a really good cap for all of, <laughs> on that like i'm not sure how much more of this genre of suffering right, like I, i'm not sure what tops that yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm also not sure how much more I can Seems take. Seems to be the most no. extreme case. <laughs> but it's been fun. I really liked Mad God. Um, it was definitely, like, I think the meteor of the two films in, ter- in terms of interpretation and, like, uh, you know, what's written there. But mm-hmm. it's... it's Yeah, I mean, it's like a big... Uh, it, uh-huh. it feels like a big, like, um, uh, Hieronymus Bosch painting. That is a great way to describe it. That's a great way to describe it. It's like, um, yeah. you know, if you were to like live in a, what is it, the Garden of Earthly Delights, you know? <laughs> yeah. <Except> grosser. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of fucked up little guys. Yeah, a lot of fucked up little guys. We love fucked up little guys. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, if it takes more suffering to see more of these fucked up little guys. I, I love, that's my favorite part of 
Dark Souls is seeing the little guys or the big guys. Right, they're always fucked up. I lo- <laughs> I'll have to admit, I'm not sure if I liked watching Mad Guy, <laughs> but it definitely felt ne- it definitely felt necessary. I liked it. I wouldn't watch. I I, I wouldn't relish the chance to look deep into the gore uh, jewelry again. But I, I think the rest of it I, I was into. All right. Any final words, Mad God V? Oh, it was a good time. Uh, you, you want to talk about next week? Yeah, next week we're jumping back into literature. We're gonna read the first half uh, of Nellie Bly's Ten Days in a Madhouse. So that's a, a first for Pleasant Evenings Book Club. We're doing nonfiction, investigative journalism from the turn of the century. Right on. I think there's gonna be fucked up people involved still. Oh <laughs> yeah, it's probably it's gonna be. We're not. Yeah, we're not too far removed from person descends into hell but who knows maybe it'll end up being it's actually really nice here and everyone's having a good time <laughs> hopefully all right we'll find out next maybe. find out right, next week. right well as always uh you know i have been hannah and uh R- roberto and corbin have joined me uh this has been pleasant evenings book club thank you and as always have a pleasant evening and more than anything else Up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. All right.